Next this evening is Acts chapter 26, where Paul makes his defense before Agrippa and Festus, and I believe among some Jews as well. And what I'd like to do, or at least the, the Jews that were accusing him, what I'd like to do is go ahead and read the chapter and look at this as an example of how at least one apostle used the resurrection. And again, understanding that those he was speaking with didn't necessarily believe this, and um, actually thought Paul was crazy. I think it kind of reflects what we might experience as we share the gospel with others today. But it didn't stop Paul from doing it because he knew what he was saying was true. They needed to hear it. They needed to believe it. So Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which the twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews." Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. 
for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day, might become such as I am, except for these chains. The king stood up and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them, and when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, this man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word. We're not going to go through all of this this evening as far as uh, the text, rather lengthy text, but we do want to consider the resurrection. Why is it, is it important that Jesus be raised from the dead? And why is it important that we share that as a part of the gospel message? Now remember this morning we saw Jesus presenting himself to Israel as their Messiah, as their King. And many appeared actually to recognize him as that King. Uh, they called him the Son of David. We didn't see that necessarily in our text this morning, but in the parallel passages. Hosanna to the Son of David. They recognized him as the one who had the right to the throne of David, the one who came to sit on his throne. They cried out, Hosanna! Save now, uh, we beg you. Basically, they were quoting a messianic psalm, realizing this is the one who would come to save them. And they came out, as we saw, with palm branches to rejoice over him, over his coming victory, because the Messiah was going to lead them to victory. But we also saw, of course, that Jesus didn't come to do what they expected him to do. They thought he came to overthrow the Roman yoke from Israel. And what he had actually come to do, of course, was to throw off the yoke of sin, which was much more dangerous. He came to do that not for the physical seed of Abraham, which is again what they thought, but for the spiritual seed of Abraham, for everyone who would receive him. And he came to do that by laying down his life. Now, as I said this morning, we don't have time to deal with, with all the aspects of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We do need to understand that all of them are important. We don't have time to do that this evening either, but we are going to work through them as we go through the Gospel of John, uh, because that's what the remainder of the Gospel is taken up with. But there is one thing I believe we should spend time on this evening that is an important part of his work, and that is the resurrection. Now, if Jesus had not died, obviously there wouldn't be a gospel. But it's equally true that if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, there wouldn't be a gospel. Everything that Jesus did from his birth, his life, his obedience to the law of God, to his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his glorification, and his coming again, all of this is essential to what he came into the world to do, which is, of course, to save all who trust in him. But more often than not, we understand in the scriptures that the Lord sums up everything that Jesus did in two things. Jesus died, he suffered, and he was raised again from the dead. I think it's interesting to note that um, in, in, um, in the Bible, uh, there's an adjective that is used uh, in the Greek language that is translated lords. Not lords like many lords, but lords as belonging to the Lord. And that that particular word means that this is something that is special to him. Something that particularly belongs to him. Something that is precious to him. And this adjective is used to modify only two things in the Bible. The Lord's Supper and the Lord's Day. Now the Lord's Supper, as we know, is something that is particularly special to Jesus because it is a memorial of his death. He said to his disciples when he instituted the Lord's Supper, do this in remembrance of me. The Lord did not want us to forget his death and how important it is to our salvation. Now we believe the early church took that statement of Jesus, do this in remembrance of me, uh, to heart and celebrated the Lord's Supper at least every Lord's Day. There's some evidence that early on they were actually celebrating it every day uh, 
as they were continuing from house to house and continuing those things that the Lord had given them. But certainly we see evidence that it was celebrated by the churches every single Lord's Day, which is why we do that. Now Paul, when he reproved the Corinthians for their abuse of the Lord's Supper, which is what we read often in introducing the Lord's Supper, the warning that comes by you know, not coming to the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, when he rebukes them, he actually tells us here that they were observing it every single week. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11.20, he says, Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, what Paul is saying here is that when you meet together for worship, which they do every Lord's Day, it should be to eat the Lord's Supper, but it isn't to eat the Lord's Supper in their case because they had abused it. That's what that warning is all about in 1 Corinthians 11. Luke tells us the early church devoted themselves to this ordinance as they did everything else that the Lord had given to them to build themselves up in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 2.42, we read this. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, it may appear here that they were just simply eating together, but what he means here is that they were celebrating the Lord's Supper together because in, in the original language, it is the breaking of the bread, and the bread refers to the bread of the Lord's table. It's simply used as what he calls synecdoche, where you have a part for the whole. So they were celebrating it often. They were doing all that they could to remember the Lord, to continue in his teaching and fellowship and prayer to advance the kingdom of heaven. The Lord's Supper is important to the Lord Jesus and it's important to him that his church remember his death, which is why he calls it his own. Now the Lord's Day is also special to him because it is the day that he rose from the dead. That's why he tells us to remember it and to celebrate it. Now the interesting thing is today is Easter Sunday, right? And it's the day we remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that really what the Lord meant by the Lord's Day? Remember it once a year? Well, that's kind of how the church has received it. That's how the church has kind of observed it. That's how it does today. But I think what the Lord actually intends is that we celebrate it every single week. The Lord's Day is a particular day of the week. It is the day in which the early church met to worship the Lord. The author to the Hebrews tells us that the command that God gave to his people in the Old Testament to observe a Sabbath and to rest and to worship continues in the New Covenant because of what Jesus did. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, he says this to the New Covenant church. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, a Sabbath keeping, the keeping of a day of rest, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. And what the author to the Hebrews means here is simply the Sabbath remains today because Jesus did his work and entered into his rest. And so we rest on this day to remember what Jesus has done. And that because this is what the Lord wants us to do, he doesn't want us to fail to meet together on this day to worship and to build one another up in Christ. He gave us this day in common so that we might do this. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, the author to the Hebrews writes this, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So all of this is simply to say this, that, that our Lord wants us to remember two things. And he wants us to remember them every week. He wants us to remember his death, that he died for us, and he wants us to remember his resurrection, that he rose again to life for us. Now we saw the importance of his death this morning. Uh, his death was a payment for our sins. It satisfied God's uh, justice completely. Uh, we call that, you know, his propitiation. 
God is satisfied. He sees the, the blood of His Son. He sees the death of His Son. He says, it is enough. The payment for your sins has been made in full. If you trusted my Son, you are forgiven. It more than covers every sin we've ever committed. But we need to understand this evening that His resurrection is equally important. Uh, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, uh, there would have been no payment accepted by the Father. So I want us to consider really two things. I want us to consider that it is important. It's an important part of what Jesus did. Again, it's one of the two things that the gospel is summarized by uh, his death and his resurrection. So, secondly, it should be part of the gospel message that we share with others. So first let's consider that the resurrection is an important part of the work that Jesus did. And I, I'd say it's important for at least four reasons. First of all, because it was prophesied. Secondly, because it is his vindication from the Father that everything he said, everything he taught is true. Thirdly, because it proves that our sins are forgiven. They were forgiven. We couldn't know that unless Jesus had been raised from the dead. And fourthly, because it is our guarantee that having had our sins forgiven, we will be raised also from the dead to enjoy eternal life. So four things we'll look at briefly on the, under the first point. So first of all, the, the resurrection is important because it was prophesied. Now, if, if the Lord says something is going to happen, then that thing has to happen. It will happen. If it hasn't happened yet, it's going to happen. We know God tells us there's a day coming when Jesus is going to return, raise all the dead, translate, I guess, all the living, gather everybody together for a final judgment. That is going to happen. As a matter of fact, the resurrection is the proof that's going to take place. But whatever God says is going to happen must take place. And he definitely said that Jesus would be raised from the dead. We saw an example in our call to worship. David was looking forward to the resurrection of the Christ. He wasn't speaking about himself when he wrote in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to to undergo decay. By the way, I should mention that when he says Sheol and his soul in Sheol and his, his Holy One to undergo decay, he's really speaking about the same thing. Sheol is not hell. Sheol is the grave. You're not going to abandon my soul, or, and sometimes soul is used for the body, the, the, the person. You're not going to leave my body in the grave. You're not going to let your Holy One undergo decay. In other words, you're going to be raised from the dead. This was the psalm Peter quoted in his Pentecostal sermon to prove that the Christ must suffer, die, and be raised again from the dead. We saw the same thing this morning in that Messianic psalm that they were quoting as Jesus was entering into the city. In Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24, which we use for our call to worship. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord was saying through the psalmist that Jesus would be rejected by the leaders of Israel. They were the builders. He would be crucified and buried. That's what his rejection is all about. But he must be raised again, which is becoming the chief cornerstone to become the foundation of his church. A day which we've just seen would be a day of rejoicing for the church. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is the day that we meet together to worship the Lord. That is the continuing Sabbath, the, the day of Christ's resurrection, when we remember that he was raised for our salvation, for our justification. By the way, that's why we're here today, isn't it? is because he designated this day to be the day we would remember his resurrection and meet together for worship.
Now, the second reason the resurrection is important is because it was Jesus' vindication from the Father. God's declaration that everything that Jesus said about himself was true. I mean, if he had been a liar, then he would have remained in the tomb, having been put to death. Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now when Jesus called himself the Son of God, how do we know that what he was saying was true? Well, it's because he was declared so to be by the Father when he raised him from the dead. How do we know that Jesus has the power to forgive us of our sins and to save us from hell? Well, God demonstrated it to the whole world when he raised him from the dead, when he emptied out that tomb, when he showed Jesus alive to many witnesses. And of course, if we have trusted Jesus, we also know he has revealed that to us personally by his Holy Spirit who dwells in our hearts. He has shown us that this testimony, his word, is in fact true. So Jesus rose from the dead to fulfill prophecy, but the reason why he was to be raised from the dead was because that would be his vindication from the Father, the Father's declaration that everything Jesus said about himself was true because if he was a liar and a deceiver, he would have simply remained in the tomb as a dead man uh, and, of course, his soul would have gone into hell, which is unthinkable, of course. Now, thirdly, it was important that he rise again from the dead because it proves that our sins were forgiven when Jesus rose. The guilt that he carried was paid for. Now, the resurrection was Jesus' vindication in another way. In a very real sense, it was his justification. I know that sounds kind of strange because we usually use the term justification if we're used to hearing it at all. Uh, in relationship to ourselves. The Bible says that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins are taken away and his righteousness is given to us and the Father sees us in the Lord Jesus Christ and when he sees us in Christ, he sees that we are perfect and we've done everything right because that's what Jesus did. And he says, ah, you are just because of the righteousness of my son. We call that justification. And that is God's declaration that basically we are saved. Well, Jesus, uh, Jesus had his own justification from the Father as well. When he was raised from the dead, it was the Father's declaration that he was no longer guilty. Now, that sounds strange too, doesn't it? Because in what sense was Jesus ever guilty? Well, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, remember, he bore our sins. That's what the Bible says. That he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He became guilty guilty of our sins, not of uh, having committed those sins. He didn't commit them, but rather in our place, vicariously, our sins were credited to him, and he became guilty. And he died in our place because of those sins. Remember the, the Lord says, actually Paul says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And when our guilt was imputed to Jesus Christ, he became guilty, and the wages of that guilt was death. That's what he underwent for us. Now think about this. Our sins are what put him to death, you see. He died in our place. And if his death, his dying for those sins, had not satisfied God's justice for those sins, if it hadn't paid for our sin, then Jesus would have remained under the power of death. He wouldn't have risen, but he would have stayed in the grave. So the fact that he rose from the dead proves that his sacrifice actually paid for all our sins, if we are trusting him this evening. Once the debt was discharged by his death, which was the payment for that sin, death could no longer hold him in its power. When Peter was preaching at Pentecost, he says this in Acts 2.24, But God raised him up again. 
putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Death had no grip on him any longer because the payment had been made. It couldn't keep him down. His resurrection proves that our sins are forgiven. You know, Paul uh, writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19, uh, an argument against some that the Corinthians were aware of that were denying the, res the resurrection ever took place and that it was even possible. But Paul is arguing here that if that is the case, then we're all lost because without the resurrection, we are not forgiven. We are not freed from our sins. Try to follow Paul's reasoning here in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19. He says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain, empty, it's worthless. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Jesus whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. Now pay attention to this part. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. By the way, when Paul says that those who have fallen asleep in Christ, that those who have died is per have perished, he doesn't mean that they cease to exist. But what he means is if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then those who fell asleep in him are in hell. Because if Christ wasn't raised, our sins aren't forgiven. Their sins aren't forgiven. Everybody who dies in Christ then would end up in hell because there's no forgiveness of sins. But the good news, of course, is that isn't the case. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Paul continues in verses 20 through 22, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all die will be made alive. And let me just remind you here that everyone who is born into this world is born in Adam and dead in Adam, which is why we need spiritual resurrection. It's why we need to trust in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. When he says here, all in Christ will be made alive, he doesn't mean everyone in the world is in Christ and that they're all going to be made alive, but everyone who trusts Jesus, everyone who turns from their sins and believes on him, they are the ones who are in Christ. They are the ones who are made alive. They are the ones who are forgiven. Christ's resurrection means that if we are trusting in him, our sins are forgiven. His resurrection proves that our sins are forgiven and that we are saved. But then fourthly, it also proves that we one day will also be raised from the dead. Christ is the first fruits, then those who are Christ at his coming. When Jesus came into the world to save us, remember, he took our nature, God becomes man, and he took our place, not only on the cross, and you know, we talk about the vicarious atonement of Christ, he took our place on the cross, but he took our place not only on the cross, he took our place in absolutely everything, in, in obedience. He obeyed for us. In his death, he died for us. In his resurrection, he was raised for us. In his ascension, the reason why we're going to ascend into heaven is because Jesus ascended to heaven. And even in his glorification, we will, when we die and go to be with the Lord, will rule and reign with him as he is ruling and reigning right now. Uh, the fact that that is true is the reason why Paul told the Ephesians, who were on earth and still alive, that they were already in heaven, seated with Jesus, because that is where Jesus is because they are in Christ, because they are united to him, because Jesus took their place in everything. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7, Paul writes this, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, 
and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Notice that here we were dead, but we were made alive with Jesus. We were raised up with him. And I think the made alive is the spiritual resurrection. Raised up with him is, is not the bodily one. That will happen in the future. But raised up in heaven, ascended with him, and seated with him in the heavenly places. We are not there in reality, but we are there like the Ephesians vicariously because Jesus is there and one day we really will be with him because Christ is there. So basically, his resurrection means that we will be raised. Everything that Jesus went through, he went through for us. Jesus was raised, we will be raised. Jesus ascended, we will ascend as well. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 through 23, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Because Jesus was raised, we also will be raised if we're trusting in him. So his resurrection was not only the fulfillment of prophecy. It was not only the Father's vindication that what Jesus claimed about himself and what he taught regarding the kingdom of God and what would happen if we trust in him, that all of that was true. It was not only his justification that the sins he bore were all forgiven so that we know that we are now forgiven, but it's also the guarantee that as Jesus was raised from the dead, we also will be raised to everlasting life when he comes on that last day. And I should just mention in the interim, because we don't know exactly when Jesus is coming, and we likely will die before Jesus comes, that our souls will go to be with the Lord as soon as we die, but he will come again with our souls to reunite them to our bodies, which he's going to raise, and then after the judgment, we will enter body and soul into the new heavens and into the new earth. Now that is why the resurrection is an important part of Jesus' work. Without it, we would be lost. But secondly, this is also why it should be a part of our gospel presentation. Okay, not just the death of Christ, not just the fact you need to repent and believe. This is what Jesus did. This is the basis of the salvation we're offering to other people. They need to know he not only died, but that he also was raised again from the dead. His death and resurrection are central to the gospel message. They're certainly central to the message the apostles preached. I mean, consider the passage we, we started with. Paul says to Agrippa and Festus and the Jews that were gathered there to accuse him as he makes his defense in Acts 26, verses 22 and 23. So having obtained help from God, I stand, uh, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. That the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. You see, he speaks of the death of Christ. He speaks of the resurrection of Christ. Uh, when Peter was preaching to Cornelius and his household, in Acts 10, verses 39 through 41, he says this, we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to the witnesses or two witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Again, you have the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, how, how are people going to know that Jesus can save you from death unless he, in fact, overcame it himself? Paul also declared to the philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts 17, verses 30 through 31, 
Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, there's many more examples in Scripture, but for the reasons that we've already seen, we need to tell others about the resurrection. It's fulfillment of prophecy. It's Christ's vindication. It's, again, His justification. And it is the evidence or the proof that we are going to be raised from the dead, which is exactly what Paul keys in on when he's talking to the philosophers at Mars Hill. He says, this is the proof that God has given to all men that one day he is going to judge the world through Jesus Christ. You know the fact that the tomb is empty means that one day we are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to be judged for what we have done, whether good or bad. Now, if we trust Jesus, all our sins will be forgiven and the only thing that will be examined will be the works we do in, in order to reward us, but... Those outside of the Lord Jesus Christ will be judged for every single bad, evil work they have done. And they will have to answer for every single one of them. The fact that the tomb is empty, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead is the proof that God is going to judge the world through Jesus Christ. We need to share that message with others. That is a part of the resurrection message. Now... Does that mean that when we talk to people about the resurrection that they're necessarily going to believe us? Well, I think you know the answer to that. No, they're not. But they should. You see, they should because it's true. Now, think about this. Paul shared this message of the resurrection with these philosophers, this, you know, these intelligent people, the intelligentsia of the Greek world on Mars Hill who had nothing better to do than just to sit in their seats and kind of argue with one another and hear people come with new ideas. They wanted to hear what Paul had to say. Well, Paul knew that they had not seen the empty tomb, but he also knew they were still expected to believe it and to believe his testimony regarding it. And God was going to hold them accountable for it because it actually happened. What Paul was telling them was true. Of course, even though they should believe it, most people still aren't going to believe it. Luke actually tells us what happened, how they responded after Paul preached on Mars Hill in verse 32. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. <laughs> but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. Oh, we'd like to hear a little bit more. But there were those who just got downright angry because of the resurrection. Now when Paul in our text was speaking to Agrippa and to Festus and to the Jews who were gathered, he sensed that his audience was resisting this truth. And so he says in verse 8 of chapter 26, why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? There is resistance to this idea, to this belief. At the end of his defense, Festus exclaimed in verse 24, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. Apparently, ours is not the only generation, ours is not the only culture that has a problem with the dead being raised again to life. I mean, if people are going to have difficulty with the existence of God, with the creation of the world by His spoken word, if they're going to have difficulty with, with the fall of mankind that one man sinned on behalf of the whole human race and plunged us into the misery we're in, if they're going to have difficulty with the two natures of Christ, his deity and his humanity, and life after death, they're going to have trouble with this too, aren't they? But let's not forget that even though there are going to be those who balk at it, there's also going to be those who believe. How do we know that? Well, look around you. Why are we here? We're here, I assume, because we believe that that actually took place. We believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. We do believe there is life after death. There were many thousands of people on the day of Pentecost who all believed at one time and thousands of people after that and even throughout the ages. God will use his truth to save. And so we should never be ashamed, we should never be afraid to say it. 
to say that it's true or that somebody might say in response, you're out of your mind. Now, how should we respond when those we share the gospel with actually accuse us of being mentally unbalanced, of being crazy? Because people are going to think we're crazy. Well, I think we should respond in the same way that Paul did to Festus in verse 25. I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. People aren't necessarily going to receive it because it's true, but the fact that they don't believe it, the fact that they don't want to receive it, doesn't make it any less true, does it? It's still true regardless of what people think about it. Truth is truth. It's not determined by how people see it. It's determined by whether or not it is, in fact, objectively true. And in this case, the resurrection certainly is. It is true regardless of how people respond to it. But we do need to remember that this is their only hope. If Jesus had not been raised, then everyone is lost. We are all lost. But since Jesus has been raised, if we have trusted him, we are saved. And everybody else also will be saved who believes and who trusts in the Lord Jesus. So the point is, even though it may seem like something that people are going to be unwilling to accept, which as a matter of fact is going to be the case, we still need to be bold in sharing it because the Lord is going to use this message to bring other people to himself. May the Lord make us then to be bold in sharing the gospel. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, do that.